Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial of our foundation level sample questions discussion. We are in our next chapter which is chapter 3 and continuing ahead with the remaining two questions of the set A and uh, we'll look forward to answer these questions as well and see how exactly we can get more confidence in order to answer them. So the next question as a part of this tutorial is question number 17 from the chapter 3 which of the following statements about static testing are most true now of course the first thing you need to recall is the static testing as usual uh, the subject of the question will help you limit your content instead of thinking a lot of things well within the chapter which could be seriously a lot of things so you don't really want to get confused so always try to confine yourself within the limited context which the subject is asking you as a part of the question so here they want to know about something on the static testing basics so of course you need to derive that what is static testing what are the several work products which you do that and where exactly static testing happens and all those sort of things right so let's look at the options here and we in this case we have to look on all the four options to validate which one is true and which one is not true that's false so option A, static testing is a cheap way to detect and remove defects. Yes, that's one of the uh, cheapest option as it gets uh, you know, started much earlier in the life cycle. Thus, in turn, it reduces the cost of finding the defects as well as fixing the defects earlier in the life cycle because not a lot of things are being created. Initially, the first document is created, so it will reduce your cost in fixing the bug. But not sure when they say most true. Let's look at option B. Static testing makes dynamic testing less challenging. Um, yes, to a certain extent, it could be also a possibility that static testing can help you to prevent defects and reduce your uh, effort required. Oh, sorry, not the word effort. It reduces your number of defects in the dynamic testing. But that does not make any just such justifications that you really don't have to conduct dynamic testing or can you eliminate some of the test cases just because you found these defects earlier not at all so it does not reduce the challenging part of the dynamic testing it still has to be interactive with the application you still have to conduct unit testing integration testing system testing etc but not from the point of uh, challenges right it still remains there but yes if you want to answer this particular option you would say that Oh yeah, if it says it reduces the number of defects in dynamic testing, yes, certainly it does. So that's where we need to concentrate the word itself that what are they trying to talk about. Look at option C. Static testing makes it possible to find runtime problems earlier in the life cycle. That's also one of the great option. It makes it possible to find runtime problems. No. It's a static testing, which is all about the work product and dynamic testing deals with runtime with the application. So did you just see, if we don't read a particular word in the statement, you always think, oh yeah, it certainly reduces problems earlier in the life cycle. But did I see what was the context? That is runtime problems, not work product related problems. So that's where it goes wrong. So each and every word plays a vital role to be sure about your right answer. Otherwise, every single option is correct. That's where people go wrong. Anyways, option D, when testing safety critical systems, static testing has less value because dynamic testing finds defects better. No such statement, no such validation or rules are written anywhere that static testing can help you reduce complete effort so dynamic testing could be something more uh, useful or finds better defects. So static testing is not at all useful. No, static testing and dynamic testing have their own respective significances. So static testing is significant from the point of finding defects in the work products, which are non-executable. And dynamic testing helps you find the defects in the application or items, work products, which are executable. So they have completely different significances and you just can't say one can complement the other or just because you're doing one, the other need not to be performed. So there's no such explanation which we know about. So the right answer here is A, static testing is a cheap way to detect and remove defects because that certainly does happen and it's a cheaper way because 
a defect when found earlier is cheaper to fix. Let's look at the next question, which will be the last question of this chapter, which we are talking in this tutorial. And that's a very lengthy question, so pay attention to me and could be very critically important for anyone to answer. This is one of that unique type of questions that when they give you a lot of stories, but ask you a simple question sometime. So let's read this carefully. The question number 18 says, you will be invited to a review. The work product to be reviewed is a description of the in-house document creation process. The aim of the description is to present the work distribution between the different roles involved in the process in a way that can be clearly understand, understood by everyone. You will be invited to a checklist based review. Now this question is coming from checklist based review and as one of the technique for static testing. And uh, this is more about distributing the roles to the people during the review that who will be doing what and kind of ownership. Now the checklist will also be sent to you. It includes the following points. So they have given you the checklist already. So checklist contains five, five, four, four items. And uh, <clears throat> is the person who performs the activity clearly identify for each activity? So while doing the review, we should answer these questions. Okay. Second, are the entry criteria clearly defined for each activity? Are the exit criteria criteria clearly defined for each activity? Are the supporting roles and their scope of work clearly defined for each activity? So four major checkpoints or checklist items which you have to verify during the review. One is the owner, like who will be performing it. Second is entry criteria. Third is exit criteria. And the fourth is supporting roles and their scope of work. That is something which you need to validate. So in the following item, okay, uh, we show an excerpt of the work result to be reviewed for which you should use the checklist above. So assume that this is the work item which is given to you and you have to use the checklist to review this paragraph which is given below. So the paragraph or the work excerpt which is given to you is after checking the customer documentation for completeness and correctness, the software architect creates the system specification. Once the software architect has completed the system specification, he invites testers and verifiers to review. A checklist describes the scope of the review. Each invited reviewer creates the review comments if necessary and concludes uh, the review with an official review done command. Right. So this is the passage. This is the excerpt which you need to review with the checklist above and you need to answer the question related to it. Now, what is that you think is the right answer? So actually, you don't have to see the options when it comes to these type of, uh, you know, explanation because not the options will drive you, but actually the understanding on the context will drive you to get the right answer. So here uh, we need to look back into the analysis and get into the understanding of what exactly does it really require to pick up the right answer. So if you see the checklist here, we need four items to be there in this. And uh, so if you see very first line is the after checking the customer documentation for completeness and correctness, that plays the role of entry criteria. Once this is done, you can start the process. So completeness and correctness check is my entry criteria. Okay, so point number two is validated. Then the software architect creates the system specification. So we have the role, we have the ownership who will be working on system specification, which is the software architect. Then once the software architect has completed the system specification, he invites the testers and verifiers to review. So who will be responsible for review? The testers and the reviewer. So again, roles and supporting roles, persons, everything is well validated here, right? Then. A checklist describes the scope of the review. Okay, you will be given with a checklist which defines the scope of the review. Each invited reviewer creates review command. All right, did we just miss something here? That there was no ownership for the checklist that who will be defining it? So we identified that specification will be created by architect. Test review will be done by the testers and verifiers. They will make comments, but checklist has no identified owners, right? So this is where we found our right answer. 
So all you have to do is now with that given context that you now know what is not fulfilled as a part of the paragraph, you can start looking at the options. So option A says point two of the checklist has been violated. No, we have the clear set of entry criteria. So point two is not at all violated. Exit criteria is also there and concludes the review, which is based on the comments. So if you see the last line of the passage, it says once we have this comment, if necessary, and concludes the review with an official review comment done. So exit criteria also exist. Let's look at B. You notice that in addition to the tester and the verifier, the validator must also be invited. Since the item is not part of your checklist, you do not create a corresponding comment. Now that's completely different thing, right? In a checklist based, the last sentence is the, it is documented that you should look also look forward to defects outside the checklist. So it is not uh, uh, limited to it. So you can always come outside and look into that. So that's not a valid option at all. But look at C, point number three of the checklist has been violated, uh, which is to measure the exit criteria. No, not at all. Exit criteria is clearly defined here. But coming to the next option, which is D, which is the only option which is remaining and could be our right answer as well. Let's see that. So point number one of the checklist has been violated because it is not clear who is providing the checklist for the invitation of the review. And that base, you know, goes exactly into the you know, expectations of what we had from the scenario and gives us the right answer there, right? So this is how you should be evaluating your answers first and look forward to the option comparisons once again, because sometimes the options can also be equally tricky. So you don't just blindly see that, okay, I got my answer by going through the passage. You just get a partial output from the passage and then you look at the options to get the 100% confirmation. Sometimes the options can be conflicting, so don't be overconfident so that you can be sure about what your right answer is. So the right answer here is D.1 of the checklist has been violated because it is not clear who is providing the checklist for the invitation to the review. So that's where we complete the chapter three of the set A. Now we'll be continuing ahead with the chapter four and looking for some interesting uh, techniques based questions. So stay tuned for that. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.